they've got the new Hangouts. Okay, so so everyone, so we are now live in three, two, one. I apologize, everyone. There's a whole new way of doing Hangouts now, and we're still trying to figure this out. So, uh, well, hi everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is a special episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. This week, we are dedicating our entire show to Comet Ison. And this is sort of part of a larger project, actually, we're doing with the Discovery Channel. They're doing a special uh, Discovery Channel, Discovery Science in the United States and Discovery Channel Canada are doing a big special on Comet Ison that's going to be broadcast on television on December 4th, 2013. And as part of that, we're going to be incorporating our Space Hangout into this and sort of the show we're going to be doing today and a lot of other really interesting stuff, so keep your eyes peeled for that, and we'll be giving you more information. So joining me for this very special, a very special episode of the Weekly Space Hangout, we've got uh, we've got David Dickinson. Hey, David. I'm, I'm ready for all ice and all the time this month. Oh, being, all ice, well, it's been all ice and all the time for you for months now. Even, so this even just more so, I think, yeah. this month. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be the big month. I know people are getting really excited about ice, and we're, we're all getting deluged with emails and calls and and lots of comments and all the posts and a lot of stuff that we want to clear up so uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, we got uh, Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Hello. Hey Nicole. Oh, wait, 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 here we go. This is great. Hello. So, <laughs> very cool. Very this is Halloween. cool. So you're going to be showing us how a comet is how to make a comet. How to make your own little comet you can hold in your well protected gloved hands. Yes. If, if, you're doing that. if you have a chemistry department at the university that you can raid to Or you can just go buy dry ice. Not just here. don't ever put it in your freezer. If you put it in your freezer it will uh, freeze your freezer and break it. Yes. I <laughs> discovered you cannot buy it in the grocery stores in this town, unfortunately. Really? Yeah, uh, but most places I've lived, you can buy dry yeah. ice in the grocery store. So. But you can buy it. Okay, yeah, we used to get it in, like, ice cream uh, cartons. We get a box with a bunch of ice cream, and there's some dry ice in it. So uh, that's this is going to be great. And we've got Dr. Pamela Gay. Hello. My uh, co-host on Astronomy Cast and the director of CosmoQuest, professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. And, uh, and you, of course, know all things comets, and so uh, you're going to be helping us out today as well. I'm bringing the science. Bring the science. <laughs> all right, so uh, as I mentioned, we it's going to be all things, it's going to be icing all the time today. Oh, I lost my, uh, my overlay. Let me bring myself back. Oh, no. Yeah, um, <laughs> right, so it's going to be all things icing all the time. Now, this even cooler is that we are filming this, recording this, broadcasting, hangouting this live from the H.R. McMillan Science Space Center in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is my hometown. And this is this is my local planetarium. So this is the one that I came to as a kid, and it's really awesome that we're able to do this here. And uh, and so hopefully we're going to get some cool shots of the planetarium later on today. So, it's, it's as cool always... How, it's cool how you have a coronal mass ejection right, right beside your head. Just coming it, out of your ear. <laughs> <laughs> is it really? Yeah. Did I get that look at? Uh, but it's a, uh, yeah, well, this is a, this is what Comet Ison is going to be facing, this terrible environment of the sun in the next uh, next month, so so we thought it would be really appropriate. But we'll be bringing some pictures of Ison as well. Um, but uh, now, as always with one of our live broadcasts, you can interact with us, and so there's a bunch of ways that you can do that. Uh, so the first thing that you can do is if you want, if you're watching this on the event page on Google+, uh, you can post a comment there, and we'll try to keep track of that. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can post any comments or questions that you might have on YouTube, and we will catch that there, and as always, we appreciate you raising the quality of the uh, discussion on YouTube. Um, and then the last thing is if you're like, if you want, you can tweet at various people, and maybe someone will get that. Uh, probably not, though. So the safest place, if you're watching this embedded, say embedded over on CosmoQuest, if you're watching this on uh, on Universe Today, places like that, you're going to want to um, click on the YouTube uh, and watch it live on YouTube, and then if you want to ask some comments, you can do that there. Great. Okay, so now we're going to get into the actual content of this uh, of this episode. And just one warning, uh, Kelly Peckham is here from Discovery Channel, and she's the producer of the episode they're doing, and she may very well want to jump in and ask some questions of the of the people. So if you see someone jump in from time to time, that's uh, that's what's going on. Okay, great. So let's get on let's get on with the actual show here. So first. Uh, I think David, I would like to get a bit of a history lesson on Comet Ison. Where did it, you know, who first discovered it, and where did we sort of find out about it, and 
and sort of yeah, know comment, that it was going to be a very special comet. We, we've we've known about this comet for over a year now. So this is kind of unusual that we've been tracking something. They knew that they had found something interesting on September 21st of last year uh, when the it's uh, ISIN stands for the International Scientific Optical Network. It's a telescopic network over in Russia that identified this comet. It was an Art Yom no, Novachonik and Vitaly Nevetsky that were the first uh, were the two uh, scientists that observed this comet and reported it to CBAT, the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, and. We knew we found something interesting when we see something that is relatively bright at a very far distance out there. That uh, this is kind of the same uh, kind of situation when they discovered Hill Bop back in the mid '90s. That they found a comet that was very distant, but we know if it's intrinsically bright at discovery, that it's going to be a very bright object. And it got really interesting when we started looking at the orbit and discovered that it is a sun grazer, that it's going to be coming in very close to the sun. It's not going to be loitering uh, in the outer solar system like a lot of comets we discovered. There really hasn't been a sun grazer quite like this one. It's not a Kruns Group sun grazer per se. It's not going to be close enough to do that, to, uh, to fall in that category of comets. Uh, but it's uh, intriguingly close to some other comets that were very bright and great comets like uh, Ikea Siki in the mid-60s. Uh, there was some uh, preliminary interest that it was related to the great comet of 1680. We know that that's not the case right now. But uh, the, it's, it's, uh, it's got a lot of the same characteristics as a lot of those types of comets. Terrific. Uh, and what was the last big bright comet that you all got a chance to experience? Who who was able to see? I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. Hayakutake. Did I get that right? <laughs> I, I saw it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Pamela, did you get a chance to see Hyakutake? Yeah, that, that one was actually extremely memorable for me. I, I was a grad student working out at the University of Texas's McDonald Observatory at that point, and it, the very first night I ever observed out there, the, the person who was teaching me to use the telescope was like, you've just got to make it to 5 a.m. Uh, and I'm like, uh, okay, I think I really need to make it till sunrise, but at 5 a.m. he nudges me. He's like, go outside. And I step out the door, and there it is above the horizon, literally a good 30 degrees of comet spanning the sky. And it's really amazing in a dark sight to see that giant tail just fanned out yeah, for all to enjoy. Comet Hayakutake looked like a comet, like what yeah. you see as a textbook. And it was cool. We had that and hale Bop, and they both were circumpolar, uh, at least for... I was in Alaska at the time, and I could just sit in my apartment and turn out all the lights and look northward, and I could see the comet right out the window. There was nothing subtle about it. I mean, it was right there. And, and of course, the last bright comet was McNaught. It's just we're northerners, yeah. so we didn't, for the most part, get to see it unless yeah. you were able to see it during daylight. <laughs> we missed yeah, Lovejoy. Yeah, I think that's and... the thing, right, is just the fact that if you have had a chance to see one of those bright comets with your own eyes, and you can see that trail that comes yeah. across the sky and the colors in the tail, and if you can see that second tail that you might sometimes see, it's it's life-changing. It's a really special event, and the fact that we're about to get one, we hope, uh, I think, I, you, you know, I think all of this excitement and enthusiasm that we're seeing on the internet is really justified, that if this does what it's, we're hoping it's going to do, this is going to be one of those events that we'll be remembering for decades now. Nicole, did you, have you had any Bright Comet experiences? Tail Bop was probably my first and really only good Bright Comet experience. I didn't see the tail because I lived in uh, New York City at the time, but it was the first time there was a major astronomical event on the news that I could see from my light polluted street, which was <laughs> awesome. So that one, that one definitely sticks in my mind. So I'm excited for this too. I think Comet Holmes in 2008 was the last uh, naked eye comet I've seen when it went into outburst <gasps> in 2008. Was that? And, I think I saw missed, that one. Yeah. Yeah, we we all missed the uh, Comet Lovejoy because it went south. So we had to watch it on the internet, but. And, and what's so spectacular about this one is it's currently hanging out in the ecliptic. So it doesn't matter if you're a northerner or a southerner, as long as you're not too far north or south. Everyone in the middle, which is most of us, are going to be able to see this this comet do its thing. Uh, yes, it's going to be amazing. Uh, so, so Pamela, now you've been, as you mentioned, you you're up at an observatory when you got a chance to see Hayakutake. What uh, what is it like to sort of like what process? is it for finding these comets in the first place? How do, how do astronomers find these things? 
The, the process for finding comets, asteroids, many of these moving targets is uh, straightforward. You take image after image after image with a telescope that doesn't even have to be a big telescope because your goal is to get a large field of view and observe it very, very precisely. So you, you want to uh, not have a lot of variation, not have a lot of hot pixels, and you take one image one week, take another image either a few days or depending on the speed of the object that you're looking for a few hours later, you subtract those two sets of images and you look for the stuff that's moving. Uh, this exact same technique was used to find Pluto. It's been used to find Kuiper Belt objects. And we also use it to find the things in the inner solar system. And we do this on a regular basis with many different nations have ne having networks of telescopes set up to do this because, well, as well as finding these gorgeous comets, uh, they also periodically find things that cross the Earth's orbit a little too close for comfort. So far we haven't found anything destined to hit us, but the worry is there's something we haven't found out there. We want to find it well ahead of time. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, you've been involved in the citizen science, in the amateur community. So what is the role that amateurs play in finding so many of these comets? Well, with objects like this that aren't where you expect comets and asteroids to be, they're the ones who are out there looking in the unexpected parts of the sky. Most objects in our solar system lie, from our perspective, in a narrow band. Uh, they lie in the constellations of the zodiac. You can see all of the planets in that same band. It's the part of the sky the sun passes through. And this is because our solar system, for the most part, is pancake-shaped, or more like a plate of, well, not necessarily flat pancakes. Um, but very occasionally, you get these comets that come from the Oort cloud, which is a sphere of icy chunks that surrounds our entire solar system. And for reasons that we don't fully understand, gravitational interactions between different objects out there will cause something to come flying our way. And these objects aren't confined to that set of, of pancake orbits. So in this case we have something that's coming in and sweeping through in an orbit that just cuts straight through the set of pancakes. Um, the surveys that are looking for near-Earth asteroids, looking for the objects likely to hit the Earth, they're confining where they view for the most part to this, well, ecliptic, to this area of the zodiac on the sky. Amateurs are taking up the slack and looking high and low to the north and south and finding these objects that are more on polar orbits. Now, Nicole, you, uh, you're a radio astronomer, and I know that uh, you know, the radio astronomers have a role in this as well. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of observations get done by some of the big observatories and the some spacecraft and even the, as it, you know, the radio observatories when these kinds of objects have been discovered? Sure. So unfortunately, we couldn't have Sandy Springman with us today. Uh, she is an <clears throat> sorry. She's an operator at the Arecibo Telescope uh, Radio Observatory, and so she sent along a spectra. So what uh, these radio telescopes can do is look at the um, you know, break up the radial light in, uh, into uh, by wavelength, kind of like very roughly like you would with a prism to make a rainbow, but you know done electronically with a radio telescope, and look for. Um, uh, absorption lines of molecules, specific molecules in the comet. And so uh, they sent this one along to share, and it's a little bit of a messy spectrum. Let me see if I can screen share this quickly. Um, and this is looking specifically for OH, I think. So a hydroxyl. I'm not. Can you guys see that very messy, lovely spectrum? Yeah, this is what they sent along. So there's a very, it's, it's, they don't even have units on the graph yet, um, but you can see uh, a dip where this, this OH molecule is, is absorbing some of the, the light. Um, and so uh, that helps us uh, tell what comets are made of. Let me unscreen share. Woohoo! And speaking of what comets Pamela, are made you're of. Muted. Oh, Pamela's muted. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, new controls. Uh, yeah. so, so one, of, <laughs> one of the awesome things about uh, this particular comment is the images that we're seeing right now are this fabulous shade of green. And a lot of people look at green and they think that it's probably from some sort of a carbon-nitrogen molecule. But in this case, it's just a carbon-carbon molecule. Um, so we are seeing in the coloring of this comment uh, well, what it's made of, it's glowing with carbon, which is kind of awesome to think It's not about. kryptonite. 
No, not kryptonite. Not kryptonite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so Nicole, do you want to do your demonstration? Because I think sure. this is the, this is great before the Bryce. Uh, oh, it's fine. I have a, I have a, I have a proper doer. Yeah, that was very cool. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite astronomy demos, and it's been done all over the place, but yeah, it's fun. It's great. Uh, and this is making of a comet uh, with, with mostly simple household materials. And so I get a, a plastic baggie, usually gallon size, to, to mix everything in. And then I get some dirt. So the thing, the interesting thing to note about comets is that it's made of the same stuff, pretty much, that we have around us on Earth. It's made of the same stuff. Um, that formed the Earth in the early solar system. So I have some dirt here. I just grabbed uh, some potting soil. The solar the system doesn't have the styrofoam bits in it to retain no. moisture. <laughs> I have so actually weird. done this, um, like scooping dirt out from probably well manicured lawn. Sorry, <laughs> that has happened. So we have dirt, and let me open up my water bottle. There is, of course, we talk about the ice in comets, and so we have some water to start with from my actual water bottle. And at this point, I ask people to tell me, what is it in the bag we have right now? Mud. We have mud. What's, Very what's, mud. I, what's ironic is that water, Nicole, may have actually come from a comet. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> We're just recycling. We're recycling <laughs> that water. OK. There are a couple of other things. Uh, so for example, you have ammonia in comets, so ammonia we see. And so I usually grab some kind of window cleaner and spritz a bit of that in there. So now we have slightly clean mud, I guess. And then there are organic molecules. So a lot of the molecules that make us up, uh, the simple versions of them may have come from comets as well. And I have a very sticky bottle of corn syrup. <laughs> that I've clearly not packed well after doing this demonstration. Uh, so I put a little bit of corn syrup or soda or something like that in there to represent the organic molecules. Ooh. <laughs> As I got <laughs> corn syrup all over my desk. And this oh. is why she's using her desk and not over my desk. Right. <laughs> That's why, OK. Can't make so, a comment without ruining a few desks. That's yeah, <laughs> fine. I have mud all over my desk now. OK. <laughs> so the, the, the special fun awesome ingredient, of course, is dry ice. And I, uh, like I said, yes, I do take some from the chemistry department here if you can't get it from a grocery store. Crush it up into a powder as much as possible. And be very, 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 very careful in handling dry ice. You do not want to handle this with your bare skin. It can give you a nasty, nasty frostbite. Um, but I'm going to scoop it out with the cup first. Actually, you should be wearing a glove at this point, but she's yeah. a trained professional. Sure, that's it. Also, never, ever, ever put it in a sealed container because no, it as it sublimates, <gasps> yes, especially a glass container. Ahem, people. <laughs> Had this happen once. Okay, so... But, but the basic ingredients of the stuff she's mixing is, is the ammonia is nitrogen and hydrogen mixed together. Water is oxygen and hydrogen. Dry ice is carbon. So we're sticking to just plain old simple molecules except for the dusty bit. And so you can see the bulk of what we deal with in our solar system is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen all frozen together um, in a cloud making surrey. Frozen together like the dust in this <laughs> in this bucket. All right, let's see how this goes. I may have put too much dirt in there. So instead of waiting for millions of years for these particles to come together and coalesce as they would have in the early solar system, I just add a bit of pressure, and I squeeze the bag. Like I said I'm not sealing it, but I'm squeezing it. <laughs> and this is the part where gloves are very handy. And Wait, what's awesome about the dry ice is, is at the pressure on Earth, it goes straight to gas. There's no melting into a liquid, no runny mess, just straight into a air you can't breathe. Yeah, which is really fun when I'm scooping it out of the big container. <laughs> in the chemistry department. <laughs> All right. Oh, I think I have myself. Oh. It, it amazes on me. The keyboard. I'm going to be really sad. It, Here it amazes we have me when, when, you, Look at when this. you hear how many millions of tons of material comets lose in a second or so. Look at this comet. Yeah, yeah, comets. So it's actually a very dirty snowball. This is probably dirtier than I usually make it. Um, oh, cool. But the dry ice chunks in there are still sublimating, and so at this point you can blow on it 
make little bits of gas sublimate off faster, uh, explaining that as I warm it up, um, oh, I have my little my keyboard, as I warm it up, um, this is uh, causing sublimation, and as it gets close to the sun, that warms it and causes sublimation, which creates the tail. Uh, I will also run around with this, yelling, I'm a comet, I'm a comet, in an elliptical orbit around whatever room I'm doing this demonstration in, which people seem to love. So there is your physical analog of a comet. Now, this comet's actually very, very different from ice. And one of the really perplexing things that, that astronomers are struggling with is as we watch Comet Ison with our eyes, telescopes that, that are looking in the color green, it's getting steadily brighter and brighter and brighter, exactly the way that we'd expect. And this is because we're looking mostly at the color of the gas and how it's reflecting sunlight. But if you look at the exact same comet using a red filter, looking at it in colors that correspond to the dust reflecting the light, it's not getting brighter. So it seems that for some reason this, this comet just doesn't have the cloud of surrounding dust that we'd normally expect. And so this is making a lot of people wonder, is it going to have the tail we'd normally guess? Um, how is it that this comet is is going to vary? We don't know what to expect. This is a virgin comet. It's never passed through the solar system before. And everyone's guess varies. There is a paper out there uh, that is saying there's a 100% probability that this comet is going to self-destruct on November 28th on its closest approach to the sun. And there are other people saying, no, it's, just, it's going to be just fine. It's going to come out the other side and appear absolutely spectacular. We actually have a well, few people taking bets in the YouTube comments right now. <laughs> Not that I encourage gambling, should, but that totally is happening. Have a pool. We should totally have a pool. And then, uh, you know. there, there was an interesting discussion out of the 45th DPS meeting a few weeks ago that I wrote an article on that actually uh, they're, they're kind of bumping up their chances of it surviving perihelion. They're saying that for the distance it's passing the sun at perihelion, that seems like 200 meters or so for the nucleus is the magic cutoff size. And everything I've seen for the estimates of ice, and they still we still don't know exactly how big the nucleus is, but the low end of what I've seen is half a kilometer up to about three kilometers. So it seems like, but again, it's it's hard to tell how well that's put together, and it's never been in the inner solar system. So, yeah. Well, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about sort of the future and um, <clears throat> sort of like you know we've talked about where it's where it came from, how it was discovered, and sort of what it's made of. And now I want to talk a bit about what's going to happen in the future. And and David, so you know from today we're recording this on November first, two thousand thirteen. Yeah. We still haven't hit perihelion. So so what are the next couple of weeks and months going to play out like? Right now, amateurs are just getting their first looks with backyard telescopes. There are people who have been imaging it for the past few weeks. It passed very near uh, Mars and Regulus recently, a few weeks ago. They got some pretty good images. The uh, MSL rover, I believe it was MSL and MRO, got some okay images of it. They're not really meant for imaging night sky objects. Uh, I got my first look at it about two weeks ago when it was near Regulus. It was about 10th magnitude. It wasn't a really bright object. Comet Enki right now is actually brighter. That one is, is there's actually a few comets in the morning to look at. Uh, Ison will be taking center stage over the next week. I think a red letter date is going to be when it passes uh, the bright star Spica on November 18th. It's going to pass within half a degree, which the full moon is half a degree wide. So it's going to pass closer than that to that bright star. So Spica in the constellation Lyra, that or uh, in Virgo, excuse me, uh, is actually going to be a good guidepost to find ice and that at that time, and it may be approaching naked eye visibility around the 18th. It's going to brighten very rapidly. Uh, one thing right now is we have the uh, the moon has been in the sky the last few weeks, but the moon is going to reach new on Sunday, so it's going to be moving out of our morning sky. So we're going to be able to do some deep sky observing once again. We've got a good two week window coming up before the moon reaches new again and comes back into the morning sky. And so then it's going to be it's sort of it's moving past Spica, and it's going to hit that. When, when's the perihelion day? When's that date when it gets the closest no, uh, to the U U.S. Thanksgiving on the evening of November 28th? Uh, we'll probably all be watching SDO and SOHO. It's going to be entering the SOHO camera um, just a few days prior. So at SOHO's Lasco C3, we'll start seeing it right now. Uh, stare, one of the NASA stereo spacecraft is already imaging ice and it's about halfway through the field of view so we're seeing it there too. SDO will probably be the key place to, to watch it as it gets really close to the sun. And, and so how close is it going to get? 
uh, with uh, visually it's going to be about an angular degree about two solar diameters physically from the surface of the Sun it gets close enough that the radius of the Sun actually comes into play for it's going to be 1.16 uh, million kilometers from the surface of the Sun which Lovejoy came much closer than that and it survived a few years ago I remember watching that on SDO and we were all on Twitter taking bets when it went because it actually physically passed behind the disk of the Sun that night for about 30 minutes and we're all like we're not going to see it come up the other side it's gone and Lovejoy actually popped back out the other side and was a great comet. Pamela what what impact I mean does the Sun have on these comets as they make this close approach they, as they make this perihelion approach to the Sun what happens to them? Well there, there's three different effects that you have to worry about one is just the gravitational stability of the object you, you have um, as the object gets closer and closer uh, the pull on either side of it is actually slightly different and if it, the pull is too great it's going to get shredded. Um, this object will probably be held together quite happily. But then the other issue is it's getting heated up and you're talking about an object with a potentially uneven mixture of chemicals. And as these things heat up, well, they release all those gases like Nicole was showing us. So you have a hot object that's going to have jets popping out in various places, and you don't know how that's going to set it spinning. You don't know how that's going to cause chunks of it to blast apart. Comets in general are fairly fluffy rubble piles orbiting through the solar system. So far, observations of this one lead us to believe that it's a more solid object. So there's a chance that this difference in fluffiness, which is a strange word to see in science papers, <laughs> but it's the one we use here, uh, this difference in fluffiness is actually potentially going to, well, either trap gas in and make it explode more violently, or perhaps work out kind of lucky for us. Uh, one of the things that's been happening so far is it seems like most of the ice has been melting off of the one side that's facing towards the sun. As it swings around, it's going to be exposing a different side to the sun. Uh, that might cause it to brighten magnificently and keep the thing a little bit safer. We don't know. There, the, there is almost no way to predict this. Uh, it could explode due to trapped gases. It could crumble apart due to gravitational forces. Uh, or it could just merrily go on its way and do very little. Right. Th this uh, is passing inside the solar Roche limit, too. I, when I was writing an article, I came across that. It's passing uh, within about a million kilometers inside the, so the fluid Roche limit. So. Yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, where this really relates to a lot of the people that are watching this is the chance that we as regular people without super powerful telescopes are going to be able to watch this. And I know, <clears throat> you know, amateur astronomers around the world are, are turning their eyes to the skies, they're getting out their binoculars, they're getting ready. So what will people be able to see, you know, starting from I today? You know, here we are on November 1st. You probably want a pretty big telescope to be able to see it today and some nice astrophotography gear. How is that going to become more and more accessible over the next coming coming just, week? Just a few days ago, I've heard of uh, there, there was an uh, observer in Czech Republic that managed to catch it with binoculars. Again, it's not a bright object in binoculars being between 8th uh, and ninth magnitude right now. And plus, when you're talking about comets as opposed to stars, with, with they have all their magnitudes concentrated down to basically uh, uh, an infinitely small point. Comets have that. They're kind of like when you're looking at globular clusters or galaxies, that surface brightness, the magnitude is spread out over the object. So it's it's just breaking binocular visibility right now. But I think the key is going to be to be under moonless dark skies, which most of us here on the U.S. East Coast don't have. Uh, the moon's out of the sky right now. And I think it's going to reach naked eye visibility a few days prior to uh, perihelion. But, of course, perihelion is going to be closest to the sun, so it's going to be very difficult to observe at that point. I think that week right after, if it survives, or if it breaks up after perihelion, we could have a long string of uh, comet fragments going back out, too. That's happened before, so that, that could be an interesting uh, uh, turn of events, too. And, and it's important to remember that this is currently an early morning object. So if you go yes. out tonight in the early evening, it's not there. You have to drag your sorry self out of bed 5, 6 in the morning, uh, depending on where you are in your time zone. And look right now, if you look for Mars, you'll find it 
Uh, your hand covering Mars will also come at the, cover the comet. Yep. To find it precisely for your location, there is free software called Stellarium. They have the orbit for ice in, in the software and go out, find out when in the morning, and if you're lazy and hate mornings, I'm with you, <laughs> I get it. Uh, this is also going to be a great object to share with your family, potentially on Christmas. Its closest approach to the planet Earth is going to be on December 26th. So in the early evening, just as the sun sets, just as it's getting dark, um, look for the star Vega, the summer triangle that we're losing as Christmas comes upon us. Uh, Northern Hemisphere folks, um, you should be in for a treat. Unfortunately, this isn't as much of a Christmas present for the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> but do you think that we're going to be able to get like that nice tail you know, leading up into the sky in the evening, or will it already be starting to dim by, by Christmas, do you think? I think it will be dim by then. Yeah, it's the, the light curve I've seen, it's, it's going to dim pretty quickly. I think that the, those very last days of November into that first week of December is going to be the key time to observe it, if it, if it survives. Oh, and, but you know, if you get that new telescope for Christmas... <laughs> right, right. Now, now with uh, with the last comet that we had, uh, it was you know it was the, the folks in Australia, New Zealand, the Southern Hemisphere got a much better view, and and we in the was it McNaught was it uh, uh, both McNaught and Lovejoy were Southern yeah. Hemisphere comets. Yeah, we're Southern Hemisphere, so we in the Northern Hemisphere didn't get a view of it. Uh, this time around, though, is is there going to be any restrictions? The whole world will be able to see it. I think it's going to be more northern hemisphere. I, th I think I think some of the latitudes, the northern southern latitudes toward the equator, will see it, but I think the far southern latitudes may miss out on this one because it's going to be going off to the northeast in the morning. Yeah. So as, as early as November 26th, it's uh, in the northern extreme of Hercules. Um, right now, it's it's you can get. You can get to it now, but you're not going to be able to get to it much longer. Right. And, and come Sunday, we'll have to get up an hour earlier, too, because we shift back to standard time right. for North America. So that's getting up even earlier. <laughs> right. You're staying up not as early. Not as yeah, early. so this is it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to give people you know, a way that they don't have to wake up in the early morning to do conflict. <laughs> but I don't think it's going to happen. That's astronomy. No. This be a morning person. You have to get out there or stay up all night if you want, if that's how you roll. Yeah, um, a, a, but get up early morning and get a chance to see it. Um, it's going to be a, the way. A very, a very interesting date, right around December 1st when the moon comes back around toward a waning crescent. It's going to be near Mercury and Saturn or behind the sun, but they're going to be in the very low sky uh, yeah. about a month from now on December 1st. I think that's where you're going to see some of the best photographs because you may be able to get Comet Ison, Mercury, Saturn, and the waning crescent, thin crescent moon all in the same frame. So that might be a very cool thing to see. Now, we've been, uh, I know we've been cataloging a lot of the pictures that are coming in from our readers. Uh, we've been posting lots of stuff on, on Google+, on Flickr. So what are the ways that maybe the amateurs can, who, you know, the folks over the next couple of months who want to get involved, take pictures? What are the resources they can do to kind of share their knowledge and information you know, around on the internet. I mean, that's the amazing thing. Yeah. This time around, you know, with previous comments, we didn't really have the internet in the same way to communicate with each other. But this time around, it is like this worldwide collection of enthusiasts who are all coming together. I've, They're sharing their information. This is unprecedented. So I've, I've I've thought about that. It's like it seems like every time a comment comes around, I remember uh, we had a very close comment in the mid '80s called Comet IRS Iraqi Alcock that came within a few lunar dozen lunar diameters of the Earth, we all heard about it in Sky and Telescope a month later because it was just that was yeah. where the technology yeah. was. Yeah. yeah, I mean, think about that. Like in the in the olden days, you yeah. would see a picture in Sky and Telescope about some comet, and then you'd know that, that a comet had come by and there might have been a chance to see it. But now, I mean, there's just this buzz that is happening. So, uh, you know, I know I know about you guys. How, like, what kind of buzz are you guys getting? You know, you're seeing on the Twitter, you're seeing in your email, we're seeing on the YouTube Google comments. Plus. That's, Google that's Plus. That's where I'm seeing it because yeah. we have the ability to socially share share our images up there, get the, get the words out. And the awesome thing about using Google Plus is it's the type of place where you stick your pictures, write your article, and then you relink from Twitter and Facebook. So do all the things, but um, 
there's, there's always great places to keep up with the pictures. Universe Today, Space.com, Space Weather, all of these places are currently collecting some of the best photos and uh, pushing them out there for everyone. Yeah, to we've got a pool. We we built a pool on Flickr uh, called the yeah. Universe Today Photo Pool, and we've got about ten thousand images in there so far. And we constantly pull images and we post them on Universe Today. We tweet them out. We repost them on Tumblr. So so we're sort of you know if you want like there's lots of places, lots of great forums. Ice in Space is a great forum. Um, but if you want a place that if you're taking some pictures over the next couple of months and you want to share them with us and then let us help sort of get the word out, definitely check out that. And you can access that from Universe Today. There's like a photo tab on the top, and uh, and we can sort of help get that uh, get that information out. And we're, we're glad to sort of compile them and reshare them. And, you know, if you've been taking pictures, that's the best thing ever. I just saw a really <laughs> nice one on the CosmoQuest Bad Astronomy Universe Today forum. <laughs> we have a oh, cool. astrophotography sub-forum where members have been posting really gorgeous pictures. And yeah. I just saw a really gorgeous Comet Ice on picture posted by one of our members. So I'm I'm kind of watching that. Um, oh, great. Well, share some if you, if you see them. Yeah. Uh, now, Nicole, when you sort of took your... You know, astronomy degree, radio astronomy. Uh, you had to do a lot of like math and geometry and learn how to find these objects in the sky. So, so do you find that sort of this, 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 and other kinds of events, as we're trying to explain, has that been sort of increasing people's interest in geometry, in learning the night sky and the coordinate systems, things like that? It might be less so learning the geometry and the math behind it, but more wanting to learn about just how to use a telescope practically. I got a lot of, uh, since, uh, like you said, I was a radio astronomer professionally, but doing outreach, it's all been optical, and so I've had to to learn, now that I no longer live in, in a big city, uh, how to actually use an 8-inch in telescope. And so, I, what was the one in 2007, 2008? Um, McNaught? McNaught? Yeah, McNaught. Yeah. Okay, that one, yeah, I or found it with, with one of our 10-inch telescopes at the University of Virginia and showed it for a public night, and it was so excited. And people, <laughs> It's good because um, you can get people to come to public events if they don't have the nice, shiny equipment that they can look at it themselves with. Uh, this one's going to be bright enough to see naked eye. That's not a problem, but it's good to uh, seek out your local observatory or local amateur astronomy group um, and, and uh, have them help you find it or show it with their equipment. I'm actually debating whether or not I want to have an early morning public observing session. We gotta we're, I'll see, we're we'll see what the interest is. We're uh, talking about doing that here at our Starkey Park group about doing a, yeah. a morning observing session if Ison is a good comet that we might we get the interest for. But I've found that the just the general conversation that I'm having with people now, you know, about <laughs> positions and perihelion and oh, yeah. positions and distances and this kind of stuff of the you know, people are really starting to understand the right. solar system in a much better level, I think that, it is, that now that it is a good it is a good steady on yeah. Was, when we had Hellbop and Hayukutaki come by, it was interesting. We had a small comet close up and a large com comet far away, so there was kind of a good contrast between the yeah. two. Maybe we'll have another small one come out of nowhere. That'd be kind of cool to see. We're well, actually um, getting a couple of questions on the YouTube channel. Yeah, let's take some questions. Exactly relating to this, um, so people talking about the orbits. And, uh, Do you want to put the question actually into the stream, Nicole? No, because Colin Tracker is not working. Um, oh, well. <laughs> but I have, so I've pulled these two out of YouTube. Uh, one of them is by R.D. Brewer. He's asking, or he or she is asking, what, why are all comets and asteroids doing about 35,000 miles an hour? As Whoa, good one. Pamela. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fire back. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's not that they're all doing that. It's yeah. that the ones that are on Earth crossing mm -hmm. orbits tend to have about the same velocity because they have very similar orbits. Comets are going to be going radically different speeds depending on where they are. Um, and this all has to do with Kepler's law of, of objects sweeping out equal area in equal time. So they're going to be going one rate as they're far, far away from the sun. And as they come in, they're going to whip past very quickly. And it just happens that, that things that all have similar orbits as they cross the Earth's orbit, due to this equal time and equal areas part, they're going to be moving the exact same rate or same rate relative to what they're doing. But their the speed of their orbit actually does change as they get closer yes. to the sun, and then as they're moving away again. So and and often what you hear quoted is the orbit uh, orbital speed on closest approach to the Earth, or the orbital speed on closest approach to the sun. If you're always talking about how so how something's going as it's closest to the Earth, well, it's always going to be about the same distance from the sun, and moving at very similar velocities. 
And we have a question also from Eric Williams, uh, which was part, I think, partly answered by some of the other commenters, but uh, I would like to put it here. Does a comet passing through change the orbits of asteroids as all as it goes through the asteroid belt? I I, I do know Jupiter can alter a a comet's orbit frequently. Oh, Jupiter can Uh, alter the comet, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I think I saw a statistic about a comet coming in the inner solar system has about a 40% chance of having its orbit altered by Jupiter. Uh, and of course, we had uh, Shoemaker Levy Nine hit Jupiter back in the '90s, <laughs> yeah. so that was, that, was uh, that was very interesting. And and the thing to remember is it, it's not Han Solo's asteroid belt. Our <laughs> asteroid belt, <laughs> or for the most part, is very empty. And sometimes we get lucky. So, for instance, if you go out next week, November seventh, uh, you're going to see Comet Ison and the asteroid Ceres and Vesta all very close to one another on the sky. But that's on the sky. There are very different distances from the sun. Uh, And it's this difference in distances from the sun that means if you're standing on Vesta, you're not going to be able to see Ceres just by looking out there. If you're trying to fly through the asteroid belt, you actually have to try very hard if you want to hit something. So asteroids are tiny. Comets are moving quickly. You just, Gravity you just isn't what you have to worry about. Direct collision at a very small probability, very, very, very small probability, that's the way it's going to have their, their uh, orbits altered on a very rare basis. Right, mm-hmm. but I mean, these comets have so little mass. I mean, they are they are the size of buildings. I mean, they are not going to, you know, some are larger than that, but they're not going to cause any gravitational interaction really with it. They're not going to pull anything out of orbit or shift no. anything or anything. No, you know, but an asteroid they might are, have a very minor effect if, yeah. if it gets nailed. Right, but more importantly, these poor comets are going to get yanked around by the Sun and Jupiter yes. and, and things like yeah. that. You, are, you just you just reminded me of something, Pamela. On November 25th, there's another bright comet in the morning right now. It's Comet Enki, which is a periodic comet. Uh, November 25th, Ison and Enki are going to be within about a degree, a little over a degree apart. Again, they're not physically close. But they're going to, from line of sight from the Earth, they're going to appear about two full moons apart. So we'll probably see some photos of that too. That'll be kind of interesting to see. Send them in. Send them in. I want those pictures. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah so pictures of of the two comets together, yeah. close in the sky. That's going to look so cool. No, uh, no, any the... more... Oh, go ahead, Pamela. So the frustrating thing that we're dealing with right now is. Every day, as the comet gets a little bit closer to the sun, it's getting brighter and brighter. But because it's getting closer and closer to the sun, you can only see it in the ever-brightening twilight. So it's getting brighter as the sky it mm-hmm, occupies yeah. gets brighter. And so when it comes out the other side of the sun on, on the 29th or 30th of November, it's going to be right in the twilight, morning, evening, yeah. make your pick. Um, and trying to see it is going to be extraordinarily difficult. Now, since it is heading north, it is going to become an object that you can see on both sides of the sunrise. Um, but it, it's still going to be harder due to oh. that getting closer to the sun problem. We, we, we had that problem with L4 pan stars this spring yeah. as it sat right there. It was a good comet, uh, but it sat right in the twilight, so a lot of people didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any more questions? Um, we have some plugs for the virtual star party coming from our commenters. So thank you guys. <laughs> yeah, well, this is you know definitely on uh, every Sunday night when it gets dark on the West Coast, we hook up a bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout. This is our virtual star party, and so it will absolutely be our objective over the coming uh, you know weeks to to try and bring you Comet Ice and live into the into the Hangouts. That's that's going to be. I, th- I think it's interesting to think that only about half a century ago, Ison at this point probably wouldn't have been discovered yet. It, yeah. It's, uh, uh, yeah. You, you hear about a lot of comets that they, they don't get discovered until they were like sixth or seventh magnitude. So we're discovering them a lot fainter and further out, which is kind of cool. And, and this one, even if it does turn out to be an optical fizzle with a not particularly dramatic tail, because the sucker's not gassing nicely, um, it still has one potential extra show to put on for us in January. And that's when the Earth passes through, well, its path through the sky is going to go through where it was. So we're looking at a mid-January, brand new uh, meteor showers, not quite 
sounding like the right word because this isn't an asteroid, but it's going to be a meteor shower. All of the flecks of material left behind as the comet makes its way across the Earth's orbit, we're going to encounter that. And so be prepared for a whole bunch of shooting stars. And there's an app for that, even. There's a <laughs> meteor counter app that's being used for a citizen science project um, tied with the Lottie mission to the moon. And so they're looking for micrometeorites hitting the moon. And one way you can correlate that is looking at how many meteors flash through our atmosphere. So you can get that app on your mobile phone and uh, count meteors and help the scientists out there. Oh, that's really cool. That's very cool. Oh. So I think, uh, you know, how do you think sort of the enthusiasm, David, for the next the next coming weeks and, you know, is going to go? What are you, you know, what are you seeing right now and what do you expect is going to happen? Mm -hmm. Some people have seen pretty, it, it seems like there's been an upsurge of optimism. Uh, right after Comet Ison came out from behind the sun from our vantage point, actually we went from the, behind the sun from its vantage point. It's not near perihelion yet, but this summer we kind of lost sight of it and then we're starting to get view of it again. It seemed like there was kind of a downtrend where people were saying it's not performing up to standards, but now it seems to be going right about down the, the middle of the minimum maximum for magnitude. So it seems, seems like there's more of a surge in optimism right now. I know a lot of people, myself included, were holding back on writing our post-perihelion uh, posts, uh, how to observe Comet Ice in post-perihelion until we kind of get into that week to see what it's going to do. I think it's either going to, if it breaks up before perihelion, that would be a very bad thing because it would totally fizzle like Ellen and did a few years ago. Uh, if it breaks up, you know, if it breaks up during or right after, we could be in for, for another show too where, like I said, we would have that string of comets or Comet Lovejoy was kind of that headless comet that went back out. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of different uh, scenarios. So. so what's the next big date? You know, here we are November 1st. What is the next big date that people should be keeping an eye on? November 28th for people who like looking at SOHO and stereo images. Uh, either side of that, there's going to be that moment when we can't see it because the sun yeah. is in the way. But either side of that November 28th closest approach, Looking it, at the satellite images to find out, did the sucker survive? Yeah. Uh, after that, it's just going to be a slow, gradual watch. Uh, personally, I am looking forward to the closest approach to Earth because there's something visceral about taking people outside and looking through a telescope and saying, this comet is new. It has never gone through the solar system before. It's evening. It's all of your family who normally <laughs> don't listen to your astronomy. But this time, you have something awesome to show them. And then in January, that meteor shower. Yeah. It, it just passed within one AU of the sun, so it's inside the Earth's orbit as of today. Yeah. So. As of today? Oh, really? Oh, yes. that's yeah. amazing. Yes. That's within really cool. One if you're Nowhere an near us, but... If you're an astrophotographer, there's a contest going on, speaking of dates. Um, the National Science Foundation and Astronomy Magazine and Discover Magazine, it looks like, are uh, co-hosting a contest. Um, and that's due January 15th, so you have plenty of time before and after a closest approach to the sun to uh, take your best shots and submit it to this contest. I can put the link somewhere if needed, in the event page. Sure, that sounds great. Cool, okay. Well, I think we, we're sort of running to the end of our hour now, so why don't we start to wrap things up. Um, so I am going to give a big thank you to, uh, to David Dickinson. Thanks, David. And where can people find out more? I am active on, I am Astro Guys with the Z across all platforms, on Twitter, on my own site. Uh, right this week I was active on Universe Today, Listasaur, Canada.com, and I will probably be chasing after the partial solar eclipse this weekend from the Florida Space Coast to watch it, the uh, eclipse rising. We won't get a total here, but I'll be driving over there to maximize my chance of uh, maybe get the VAB behind the partially eclipsed sun. Oh, that's going to be cool. Yeah. Dr. Bogalucci, where can we find out more? Oh, I live at uh, CosmoQuest.org. <laughs> I work for CosmoQuest, and I'm also a noisy astronomer on Twitter and everywhere else on the interwebs. So. You are everywhere on the interwebs. <laughs> Dr. Pamela Gay, where do we find out more? Uh, I am also at CosmoQuest, but then, of course, there's Astronomy Cast, where you can find both you and I uh, every Monday, and we will hopefully be going live Monday afternoon with a talk on the sun, so you can find out more about how all these different layers of the sun are going to try and suck the life out of Ivan. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'm Star Strider on all of the interwebs. And so here's my here's the thing. If this turns out as great as we hope, then let's come together again in another month and a bit, and let's do the actual you know 
if it's actually that great and people are able to get a chance to see it, let's give people some observing tips and give people a big update maybe in about a month from now if it's all happening. Cool. Great. Sounds like a good. All right, that sounds great. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Really appreciate it. As I mentioned, this is going to be part of a uh, special with Discovery uh, Channel Science. It's going to be on uh, December fourth, two thousand and thirteen. So uh, if you if you miss it here, you can watch it on TV later on. So, uh, but there's going to be a whole bunch Very more cool. stuff in the, in this special. So it's going to be really great. So thanks again for everyone for watching. Thanks to the panel for joining, and we'll see you all next week. Thank thanks. you, Fraser. Stop broadcast. <laughs>